feel like sometimes life is really mental. Dude, that's actually a really good name for a podcast. <laughs> know your patterns, know Even that, because that's up, going to help you, deeper, you in terms of knowing what to fix. Because if you don't truly like look dead on in the face of what is wrong, then you're not going to be able to fix it. Hey everyone, welcome back to an amazing episode today. We have Dr. Sasha Hamdani, and we're going to be talking about what it's like to have ADHD the symptoms of ADHD, what you can do to help yourself when you have ADHD and how to support those that are also dealing with their ADHD symptoms and trying to navigate that. So if you're excited for this episode, please share it with a friend, like, subscribe and follow us at Really Mental Podcast. I want to ask you, Will, getting into this, what are you most excited to learn about when it comes to ADHD and what are you curious to know regarding this topic? Definitely. I think for me overall, just what it feels like to have ADHD. I think it's easy to almost over diagnose with things in buzz terms like ADHD. It's such a broad thing that affects a lot of people. So understanding what that actually looks like and how you can also be a better friend to someone that may have ADHD, even if you don't have it. So I'm excited about those things because I definitely have seen how it can impact people's lives and their workflow. And I really want to understand this more. So as you're listening, if you hear any points that you think could help someone, make sure to share it with a friend, as Harrison said. And yeah, hopefully you find this helpful. All right, let's hop into the episode. We have Dr. Sasha Hamdani with us today, and we're talking about ADHD and everything that comes with that in terms of how it affects your mental health and just generally learning more about it. So to hop into it, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? I am a psychiatrist and I'm an ADHD clinical specialist. I got into that line of work because when I was in medical school, I was really struggling with my ADHD and I, you know, I was trying to figure out how to best cope with it. And as I was going through my rotations, I eventually landed in psychiatry loved it. And then I was like, oh, okay, this seems very natural. And that's what kind of led through this journey of becoming a specialist in it. I want to bring it back for a second and just ask a basic question for those that are listening that don't know, what is ADHD? How would you explain it to someone? Yeah, sure. So ADHD is a neurodevelopmental condition. So basically, it's something that more often than not, you are born with. And it's something that impacts your focus. It impacts your emotional regulation. So ADHD is broken into three separate types. It's broken into inattentive type, hyperactive type, and combined type. So inattentive is exactly what it sounds like, right? It's difficulty with retaining information, difficulty with the initiating tasks, being forgetful, difficulty maintaining routine. Those are all inattentive types. Hyperactive, you're dealing with more like physical and verbal impulsivity. So difficulty staying in your seat, difficulty keeping your hands to yourself, difficulty not interrupting somebody else in conversation or talking too much. And then combined type is obviously a combination of the two. That's really helpful background. What do you feel the best ways are for a person with ADHD to take care of their mental health? Honestly, and I talk about this all the time, I think the best thing you can do for ADHD, I mean, and this is even above and beyond medication or getting treated, is knowing your patterns, right? Because I think that if you truly understand, like, what is it that you do and what is it that you want to do, you could see where the holes are. So I think the problem with ADHD is a lot of times you have this motivation for like, okay, something is wrong and I want it to get better, but you don't really know what to fix. And you don't really understand that until you actually deep dive and look into like, what am I doing in terms of sleep? What am I doing in terms of eating? What am I doing in terms of hydration? Like you don't know any of those simple variables because you don't really, you haven't really tracked it over a period of time. And so I think that's one of the most important things that I learned it really late in the game, but I wish I had learned it a lot earlier and I had actually started to implement and utilize it. So I created an app for people to work on behavioral modification with ADHD. And like one of the biggest things that I'm obsessed with is because a lot of people have difficulty like looking at their patterns. This is something that tracks it for you. So it tracks what your focus looks like, what your impulsivity looks like, what your water intake is like, what your meal intake is like, what your sleep is like. And so it just does all that for you. And there are a lot, there's, you know, that's something you can keep track of on your notes app, but it's just, it's just nice to know where you're at. Totally. And what's the app called for people listening that do want to check that out? It's not released yet because we're, I mean, it's done. 
it's totally done, but we're trying to make sure that it, it, like we can handle a big number of users at a time. But it's called Focus Genie, and it's just a behavioral management app for specifically ADHD brains. And it's got educational modules, so you can learn about ADHD and these little like social media esque swipe throughs. It's really easy. It takes like a minute to go through them. It has that focus tracker where you can you basically track all of these and then over the course of time like a week or a month or like three months you can look and see all your patterns in graphs and it's really easy i wanted to ask like a lot of people when adhd comes to mind they think that there's kind of like this craze i don't know if you've seen that everyone thinks they have adhd or like they're (laughs) always talking about it and like it's this whole thing because i don't know i feel like sometimes it's hard to tell with some of the symptoms and stuff like you might struggle to focus but it might not be because you have adhd that might be because of something completely different how does someone know or go to someone to kind of see if they have adhd so as a practitioner as a psychiatrist so i've been practicing for about 10 years right i feel like my life it, when it, as a doctor is really like pre-pandemic and post-pandemic so pre-pandemic I don't feel like ADHD was talked about nearly as much as it is now. And I think it was really due to the pandemic, right? We we all had to isolate and the world was totally different. And so two things happened. Number one, people got to take like a long, hard look at their symptoms. And number two, we had this explosion of dialogue happening online with talking about ADC, talking about neurodiversity, talking about autism, talking about all of that kind of stuff. So because of that, I think there was a lot of heightened interest in ADHD, which led to a lot of people getting to a spot where they're like, I think I have ADHD and maybe not going through the formal diagnostic steps of getting evaluated by a mental health practitioner. I get the question all the time, like, when should I seek out help for this? And honestly, my answer is like, whenever you have an inclination or if you feel like that diagnosis could help you, it kind of depends on what what is your intended outcome like what do you want from this situation is this to understand your brain better is it to get medication like because that impacts kind of where you go i think in terms of getting treated the best resource is a psychiatrist and we are able to treat it from a medical background because we've been in medical school we've been we're able to look at it it from a psychological sphere where we're looking at all of these intrinsic factors and we're able to look at it from a psychiatric phenomenon, looking at like what's playing a role. Is it also depression? Is it anxiety? Is it a combination of things? Yeah, I think understanding the process for being diagnosed and where to even go is really important. When it comes to say that time period before going to the appointment, what would you say some things and strategies people can use to like make a start now about taking care of themselves mentally with their ADHD? So mindfulness, again, I'm biased. I think everybody should work on mindfulness, right? Don't you think the world would just be so much nicer? So much more peaceful. Because I think that like at its base, ADHD is your brain is moving too fast, right? Your brain is moving too fast for you to process all of this input of data and emotional information. And it's just like chaotic. And so mindfulness is this practice where you are actually able to slow down that process. And maybe it's not like right away, because for a long time, I thought mindfulness and meditation and things like that were making your brain quiet. And I had a real problem with that because I was like, that's like never going to happen. No way. But I think when I started to reframe that, it's like mindfulness is not quieting my brain. It's just neutrally observing my thoughts and kind of slowing down enough to kind of see what's going on and just like kind of then you actually do start to slow down and things get a little bit quiet but it's like a practice right you have to work at it and you have to kind of utilize that skill set and so I think mindfulness is fabulous it's like made for people with ADHD because it's so helpful it's just something that we don't immediately grab four out of our toolbox because it's boring even the thought of doing five minutes when you haven't tried meditation is like I'm gonna sit still for five minutes and do nothing what like in a world full of stimulation that sounds crazy we watch videos and our attention span is going to like 10 to 15 seconds now with apps like TikTok so the thought of five minutes, that's like so crazy. So many TikToks. Um, 
<laughs> I know so many TikToks to be watched within that time. What would you say would be some of the things that people can do to get themselves in the mindset of changing their behavior and making better decisions when it comes to their mental health? I think that boils down to, again, knowing who you are, right? There are a lot of people that are like, I want to change. I want things to get better, but they can't, t like, as a, as a provider, when I ask that question, like, what do you want to get better? They can't tell me. They can't tell me what's wrong or where the hole is. They're just like, something's bad. Something is wrong. And even when I get things like, I can't focus, is it... I can't focus because I'm so anxious? Is it because I, I can't focus because I'm overwhelmed? Is it I can't focus because I haven't slept? There's so like so understanding yourself is really important in that process. So that would be my best advice. Know your patterns, know that because that's going to help you in terms of knowing what to fix. Because if you don't truly, truly like look dead on in the face of what is wrong, then you're not going to be able to fix it. And I think a lot of people are just like averse to that because they're like, I don't want to, like, I know something's wrong and I want to fix it, but also it's hard to look at what's wrong. And so they just kind of ignore it or they like mask or they cover it up with something else or they do like the quick fix, right? And I was wondering, I sort of feel like where we're at in this conversation is talking about, you know, we've spoken about before and the steps to getting diagnosed when you are going through the process of being diagnosed, how can you, as a friend, be supportive and understanding, even if you don't feel those symptoms that they're going through? Honestly, like the best thing you can do is talk about it, right? Because I think that a lot of people, when you're, and this isn't just ADHD, I think this is any mental health condition. Nobody wants to talk about it. Like they feel like, oh, okay, this is this is a sensitive area. It's like very private. This isn't so, like I don't know how to navigate this sensitively. And so they just don't talk about it. And then what happens is that the person going through this experience feels very isolated, right? I can't talk about this. I have no outlets. I I'm making them uncomfortable. I'm burdening them with this. And so it's this dual sides of, and basically this is like based on a misconception that that either side is uncomfortable. If you talk about it, at least you know. Like, and I've had situations where I've talked with others about this. And most of the time, 95% of the time, the conversations are like, oh my God, I'm so glad we spoke about this. And I like preemptively talk about my ADC. Hey, this is something I'm working on. If I don't text back, that's what's happening. I'm not mad at you. This is what's going on. And I've also had people that I've had this conversation with and they're like, you know what, this is a little bit uncomfortable and it's hitting kind of close to home and you don't have to talk about that with me. And I'm like, okay, you're not ready to have this conversation and that's fine. That's fine. But I, I the 95% of the population that's okay with that, I'm glad that for that 5% that's uncomfortable, I, I didn't continue that trajectory with everybody else. When it comes to just relationships in general, like friendships, family, partners, how does someone with ADHD, how do they approach those things differently? I think it depends on a couple of different things. I think like a lot of times people just get really wigged out about ADHD. Like I have this, I don't know if I can have a relationship or I don't have, I don't know if I have the capacity to focus long enough to maintain a relationship which isn't true, right? I, I think it's all about finding a compatible partner in that that is willing to listen to you, that hear you, communicate with you, that you can give a give and take in their understanding of the situation. I think that's exceedingly important. I think with ADHD, you have a couple of unique challenges. Number one is impulsivity, I think comes in play a lot. I think that a lot of times for people who don't understand that that's kind of where the ADHD brain goes, ADHD people look thoughtless or reckless or, or rude. Or, and so that gets a little bit tricky to navigate in a relationship. The other thing that's really, really important and not talked about enough with ADHD because it's not technically part of the diagnostic criteria, even though almost 100% of people with ADHD have this is rejection sensitivity. So people with ADC are exceedingly sensitive to rejection or criticism, which makes it 
really hard to be in a relationship, right? And so I think that that's a unique challenge that plays a role. And that's that's plays a role in not only like romantic relationships, but friendships as well. That that becomes really difficult to navigate. Wow, it's so interesting hearing how it plays out when it comes to opening up the conversation as a person with ADHD that is on the journey to accepting it themselves. What advice would you give to people around starting that conversation with a friend that may not understand where they're coming from or what they're feeling? Do it before you fight. So my advice would be a lot of times people have those conversations about ADHD and and talking about ADHD and talking about like, oh, I did, you know, I, I'm really sensitive to rejection. So that's why that happened. But it's happening after you guys fought. So it feels like an excuse. And it's not, but it just feels like that because of the timing of the conversation. Whereas if you have that conversation early before there's a fight, you're you're setting a foundation for this friendship and relationship that you guys can work off of. And then your partner's more aware of like, okay, this is something that has been mentioned before. And for the person that has ADHD as well in this dynamic, how can they respect the boundaries of their friend? That comes with time, right? I think that especially if you're like, I value this relationship and I, you know, I want, I want things to progress forward and I want to repair what this could look like and if they need time I need to learn how to be patient and kind of cool off on my own without kind of jumping to immediately resolve it or fight or do what I need to do in the second and so I think that comes with time and experience because a lot of times you're making that decision off the cuff and there are times where I'm like you have this sense of urgency where you're like I really want to fix this problem right now and the other person, that's the last thing that they want. <laughs> and so it, it just, it really comes with being able to read the situation. When it comes to ADHD, and as you know, we were describing earlier, the brain moving almost too fast yeah. for the person. Is that something you can develop if you have really poor habits, which contribute to that? So I get this question literally all the time because people are just like so incredibly worried about TikTok giving them ADHD. (laughs) No, TikTok doesn't give you ADHD. Can we have that for clickbait though? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) TikTok is giving you ADHD. No, please. (laughs) It's not. Like, it's not. I, I like, so people are so up in arms about like, this is worsening my attention span. And you know what? It, it, easily could be worsening your attention span, but it's not giving you ADHD. ADHD is a complicated multifaceted neurodevelopmental conditions. And there's some there's some data showing it can be caused outside of birth, like with toxins or things like that. But the, the data is poor. More often than not, this is something that you're born with. And yes, there are things that can worsen it. And there's bad habits that worsen it but you're not going to give yourself ADHD. Being able to like, and I guess you could call it self-soothe when you're going through kind of those emotional conversations. How can someone with ADHD stop themselves from spiraling and be able to allow themselves to self-soothe and take that step back when they're so obsessed with just going forward, dealing with it and asking those questions and bothering and calling and you know what I mean? Oh, yes, I do know what you mean. (laughs) I'll give you a really like an example you didn't ask for, but I'm going to do it anyway. My husband is basically a golden retriever. He's so nice and like so gentle and so sweet. And I beef with him constantly for no good reason. (laughs) But when I do, when we do have these little tips, and especially early on in the relationship, he would be silent and he would just like kind of go into his little shell and I would literally chase him around the house. And I'm like, and another thing, and then he'd be like, leave me alone. <laughs> and so I think that the, there is that sense of urgency. And what I learned over time is that urge is never going to go away. I will always have it. I always have that urge that I want to chase him around and immediately resolve the thing. But now I know enough that that's not how he copes and deals. And we need he needs time to read and, and process and think. And so what we've done is like now that we know each other's communication style, the thing that helps me is I know that I have that sense of urgency. So I write during that time. I need to write and get out what I'm thinking and feeling because then I feel better immediately now that I've gotten it out. And he can take that and read it in his own time. But I'm not pressuring him to do that. 
So it's it's something that we've kind of learned in terms of like, okay, this is this is what works for us, but that urgency doesn't go away. It's just how you deal with it. I think the idea of, you know, establishing and figuring out the right communication style is so important. Yeah. I even learned on a trip overseas with my girlfriend that the way she processes stress is so different to me. And so I think like you were saying, just having that awareness goes so much further in sort of creating, I guess, healthy communication, because then you can understand more where they're coming from. Do you feel as though people can work on developing that awareness? I think so. I think so. I think that it it stems truly from, from communication, right? Because once you have enough data points, you can work on behaviorally modifying and kind of building up your to- distress tolerance, right? How much of this can I deal with because it's physically uncomfortable or mentally uncomfortable for me to accommodate my partner or my friend or whatever? But you're not going to know that unless you guys have these conversations and if you have this discourse. And, and that's what that's what's going to keep you going forward. Because if it's like a closed loop, right, you're, you're giving them space and nothing really gets resolved, you're not going to do – that's not going to be – a muscle you continue to build. You're going to be like, that sucked. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just emotionally respond next time because that's easier. And that's what my brain wants to do anyway. How do you do with then like hyper obsessing over certain things? So you might've had the conversation, you might've come to a resolution, but in your brain, you're still hyper obsessing over that one topic or that one thing. And you want to continue having the conversation basically forever. I do that. Oh my gosh. Calling me out here. (laughs) I thought you guys were directly talking about me. No, I this is, I was just talking about me when I was asking <laughs> these questions. I feel like it is very, very common to get caught into this circular spinning pattern, especially if there's a sticky point to it, right? If there's something that you don't feel is adequately resolved or you don't feel like has given you appropriate closure and that you're like, okay, I, I can lay this to bed because usually just like we were talking about with the ADHD, your brain moves too fast. Usually what happens is that you get to a point of resolution, but your emotions haven't caught up yet, right? You get to a point where you're like, oh, okay, reasonably, rationally, I'll give you an example. If you get, if you're furious, right? I'm calling my husband. I've called him 10 times. He's not answering. And then I, you know, three hours later, he responds and he's like, I was at lunch. Now I'm like, first of all, I I went from like being worried to being sad to being so mad. And now like lunch happened. I'm like, oh, he was at lunch. He had to put down his phone. So like that makes sense to me. But at the same time, I'm still not over that huge emotional like roller coaster that I was feeling. And so I'm not done with this. So I want to keep kind of exploring it a time. Well, you should have done this. Well, you should have had your phone. Well, okay, but that happened like three hours ago. Like that's not going to fix the situation, but my brain is still going there. And obviously that's a small example, right? If you have something a little bit more complicated or emotionally more dicey, you you spin more, right? So what, what it's taken for me is recognizing, okay, there is that that disconnect between like the logical resolution and my emotional resolution. I need to get my emotional resolution the rest of the way there. And then it's like, how do I cope with that? And I do it the same way that I do when I'm fighting. I have to write or I have to like do mindfulness or I have to find a way to kind of bridge that gap and get my emotional self to get to that point of closure. And that's not something I can do with my partner. It's like talking to them isn't going to get me there any sooner. I have to separate myself. I have to do it on my own. I have to process and get there. So usually it's like, I just need time to myself. What if it's like your thoughts impact your emotions because the person that you're with is like, the actions kind of impact your thoughts and then your thoughts impact your emotions. You know where it triggers your emotions, but you don't know how to stop it. Then the question's a little bit different, right? The question's not necessarily like, how do I stop that emotional cascade? Because that's, you're fighting your very like brain chemistry and nature, right? Like if your brain's going to do that, your brain's going to do that. The question really is, how do I manage it, right? How do I manage it before this becomes problematic? So I will tell you, when I'm in those situations, I will go through those emotions. And now I've gotten to the point where I'm like, okay, what's like a harm reduction model? If I'm still going to feel those kind of things and I'm going to cycle through those emotions, 
how am I going to do it in a way that I'm not spinning about it for the rest of the day and it's ruined my evening or it's, you know, or it's going to fracture this relationship. And in that way, it, it comes down to either having a discussion or like talking it out or doing mindfulness and journaling or or truly like learn what what has helped me in some of those like very strong action triggered emotions like something triggered this and now I'm feeling a lot it's learning about the emotion and learning about like specific tools so specifically for anxiety you can do things like grounding techniques because anxiety your brain is moving too fast and you're spinning out of control so grounding technique kind of is like a therapeutic distraction and so like once you once you educate yourself when you're having those big big just big emotions you if you can educate yourself and find like two or three tricks in that you can start utilizing them so i mean that i i encourage everybody to spend a little time doing that that's so helpful and this conversation has been really enlightening for me just in terms of learning like a different experience that people have especially when it comes to adhd and what are some of the benefits that come with having a disorder like ADHD, if any? Do you feel like there's any perks for you where you're like, because my brain operates this way, I feel I'm winning? No. <laughs> no I mean, that's not fair. <laughs> that's not fair. So, like, I don't, I think that there are, there are some plus sides of ADHD in terms of, like, creativity. The fact that you're less risk averse, honestly. So, you might take bigger chances and get bigger rewards from it you might and that's why a lot of entrepreneurs have ADHD you have the ability to sustain focus for long periods of time if you're interested so you might do like what people typically are doing for like a month you could get done in two days you know they, so it, there's some things that are really wonderful but if you're asking me which I know you weren't but I'm going to tell you anyway if you're asking me like would you rather have it or not have it? I would rather not have it. This was such a good conversation. And the first I've had around ADHD, hopefully the first of many when it comes to mentioning it and talking about it and giving it awareness. Thank you so much for your time. Of course. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. And it was so fun. Yeah. So I loved that episode with... Dr. Hamdani, and I wanted to ask you, Will, what was your biggest takeaway when it comes to ADHD? So I found it really interesting on a couple fronts. I think when it comes to having something like ADHD, it reminded me hearing her speak how important it is to just be open and talk about it so that it doesn't feel like such an uncomfortable thing to have. I also thought that she shared some really helpful tips for if you do have ADHD ways that you can soothe yourself and also just be aware of your emotions and how they're impacting you. I think those are really healthy, important things when you are, whether you think you have ADHD or you have been diagnosed with it. I think that having those easy to grab at techniques to soothe yourself, that's really important. I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to this episode. We really appreciated having her on and also having you with us on this journey. If you found it helpful, make sure you like, subscribe and follow us on our socials at Really Mental Podcast and watch out for another episode next week. We're dropping episodes every Sunday and we have another very exciting guest coming then too. Have an amazing week.